Okay, so in the last lecture, I we, we looked at this, we looked at sequences of passing, and we looked at passes a lot. So I don't think I'll say this again, but I wanted to remind you of the context for this. We look at sequence, uh, sequences of passing, and we're interested in if we can find passing patterns in various teams. All oh, right, so I, I thought I'd, I'd already now lift up. So there's some very nice um, nice examples coming in in the um, in the group chats on the web page and also in the Slack group where people have posted some of their um, their pass maps and so on. This one is by Diego Escribano, and he had an analysis. He was very interested in um, Cavani, Uruguay player during the World Cup. And his, what I liked about it is he set up an hypothesis that Cavani was one of the most important players in this game. He'd scored, he scored two goals. And so he wanted to see to what degree this, um, this really was the case. And he found that, very simply, Cavani hadn't really been that involved in passing um, during the games. These are the greens are his successful passes and reds are his unsuccessful passes. And so he hadn't been heavily involved in passes. And then he also had the three shots. So he'd had three shots and he'd scored two goals. So he was well outperforming his expected goals. So that was a very simple hypothesis that he stated. Cavani was um, one of the central players against Portugal. And then he could sort of test that hypothesis by looking at his shots and his passes, which I don't, I don't know if he dismissed the hypothesis or not, but he, he gave a sort of more balanced and nuanced look at that particular hypothesis. This is another one which I very much like that came in from Philip uh, Winchester, also in group two. And he just basically plotted here the passes of Ramin Rez Rezian. <laughs> Sorry, my pronunciation is terrible. Um, in the first half and the second half. And he looked at the question of counterattacking um, football by Iran in that tournament. And so could find these really long passes um, into the box or forward from the from the right wing um, where he was playing and um, in both the first half and this and especially in the second half in that match uh, how successful they were I brought up Phillips because he wrote a very nice um, answer to the mini challenge very much down the lines of, of what I'd like to see very simple text. So a lot of you seem to be having trouble getting these types of things into one or two pages is what, what I really want to see. And he did manage to get it quite nicely in, in one page, mainly partly through formatting, of course. Um, but this is what you have to think about when you're delivering these types of things. I really want to see a sort of simplicity of um, wording, stating your hypothesis, getting down to the data and testing things in various ways. And what Philip did as well as, as plotting these, um, these passes, he also looked a little bit about the time taken to um, come to a shot from getting the ball back. So a bit more advanced statistics in there as well. Um, but nice, um, nice message, nice central analysis of, um, of how a team played. It's interesting. Both of those, both of those matches were against Portugal that were analysed. Other people have analysed lots of lots of different matches. Okay, and and that brings me on to this. So the, the sort of the next step from going from our sort of visual understanding is really going up to a statistical understanding of football. It's one thing to make plots of passes and um, where they occurred on the pitch, but how can you actually use statistics to get insight from these particular plots that you've made. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on today. Um, and, this, and this really illustrates the problem here. This is all the passes by England's woman in the last World Cup. And can we extract any information at all from um, from this this plot, I would say it's very difficult to extract. And so this is this is they're attacking left to right, and there's plots, there's passes everywhere. There's more passes here in their own half, slight more density here. There's definitely less passes where you get to the box, where of course you want to shoot. Um, there's, but there's less passes in general here, and that's just basically because it's harder to pass in football. 
So there's not really any deep insight that we can gain just from plotting all of those, those passes. And well, what can you do? Well, the next step is to plot a heat map of all the passes. I've plotted them here with five lanes and five sort of heights of the pitch. I'm not sure that, I think, I think with the lanes, this is probably one of the optimal ways to plot this. Often football trainers talk about these five different lanes. So there's the, the five different corridors. There's the left corridor here, the right corridor here. This is often called the left white, the left half space and the right half space. And then this is the central corridor. And so this is something which if you present it to a coach, they'll understand intuitively these, these different corridors. This, is, this in particular, this area here is seen as very important to control as an attacking team because that's where a lot of chances come from. Um, that's it. So I think, I think five lanes across here is a very good way to divide up the pitch. You might here actually want to go for seven boxes, um, but I just conveniently did it as a five by five. So I think this is a good resolution, resolution to look at football um, because any deeper resolution than that doesn't necessarily correspond to what, uh, how, how coaches see the game. You can make a slightly deeper resolution. I did it here and there might be some benefit to this. This is a sort of 10 by 10 plot that you can see, well, there's a bit more, a bit more about how there's an intensity of passes here and here. I'm not sure. I, I think that as a sort of standard resolution, in particular for thinking about coaching aspects, this is probably the, the, the best one to, to have. But you have to be aware of it and you might want to go down to a lower resolution. But the main problem with this plot isn't, isn't the resolution, um, or, or this I said the resolution isn't the problem with this. The main problem isn't the, um, the resolution. The main problem is the... Um, is the fact that we have all of the passes included. We don't just have the passes from uh, that lead up to a shot. So really what we're revealing here is that England play quite a lot in their own half, but that's not actually interesting either to the team themselves if they're analyzing how they play or to the opposition if they're trying to scout England and, and work out how to play against them. So what we can do is we can look at passes um, within 15 seconds of a shot. And now we actually have, this is, so, the, so what I've done here is I've taken all of, I've taken all of the shots that England had during uh, the World Cup. And then I've looked at all of the passes that occurred within 15 seconds of that particular shot. And the code is up there in the, um, in the GitHub. I'll go and have a look at it soon. But now you have a lot less passes and you can maybe start to see a bit more of a pattern. I don't know. I, I've analyzed the data, so I know there's more passes here on the right than there is over here on the left. And then we see that in the heat map, if we count the number of passes per match from these different areas, we start to see that there's a lot here from this bottom right-hand corner. Um, there's a few over here, but in general, there's a real tendency for England to attack down the right-hand side. A lot of their passes um, are down the right-hand side. Okay, so let's just think about a limitation of this. Well, I haven't done, there's lots, in every visualization, there's always lots of limitations. So what I haven't done is I haven't adjusted for the expected goals of the chance created. So I've just said every shot is a chance. So a shot from out here, is counted, a shot from out here is counted. It doesn't matter where the shot comes. So one thing you can do, and I've, I've suggested this as a challenge, is that you um, look at all chances with greater than 5% XG. So 5, 7% XG is normally a good, a good cutoff point for a good chance, I think. It sounds low, 5 or 7% chance of scoring, but those are the types of, those and above are the types of chances that you want to generate as a team. Um, and I haven't compared this to other teams, so maybe all teams compare on the right, attack on the right. Are, are England successfully coming up in the opposition's half? There's no comparison there to other teams, and that's what we want to do in a more statistical approach. 
Um, I thought this was interesting. You can actually see, you can make a very simply from the data frame, you can make a passes made by each player. This is total passes. So it's not adjusted for minutes played, but you can see that Lucy Bronze is making a lot of passes and Frank Kirby is also making a lot of passes. And Lucy Bronze, as we saw earlier in the picture, she plays on the right wing. Um, not corrected for um, minutes played. And um, again, it could be corrected for expected goals. Now, Yeah, somebody says I'm not getting all the questions. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to look at this. So I'm, I'm just going to have a quick quick pause to answer some of your questions. Let me um, let me just have a look in here if I open up there because I think that there's not, I'm not finding all the questions. So now I'm going to take the last last uh, ten minutes now before we have the break. I'll just go through all of the questions, and you've also got a chance to ask me more questions. Look at this. So I'm, I'm just going to have a quick. Whoops! Now we're going to get feedback. There we go. Um, and so right, so just uh, I'll, go, I'll go through each of these questions one at a time. Do you recommend using libraries for visualizations or do you prefer coding everything? So definitely I prefer coding everything. I don't say that my visualizations are the best and nicest visualizations ever. That's why we had uh, Peter McKeever on last week to give you some advice about um, doing these things. And um, using libraries, of course, we're using libraries in the sense that we're using Python libraries, but they're, they're coded um, for everything. So that's why I, I do myself and usually do it. And the reason I do that, and I think I'm going to come back to this a bit later in the, in the discussion, the reason I do that is because you're all, as a data scientist, you're always sort of trying to work with the data and trying to build up some sort of understanding um, that way. And if you have predefined ways of looking at the data, you're not going to find as many new things and you're not going to be able to answer questions in the same way. So I'm definitely a big fan of that you should learn how to do the coding part of it. Of course, if you're a user of these, these systems, then you don't have to do the coding. So there's other people who are going to use these systems and not do the coding. But in this particular course, where we're trying to think about being a data scientist, then um, we need to do the coding. Uh, can we say, yeah, yeah, it's funny. OK, a great question about Ronaldo. Yeah, is actually Marcelo going up? And I write about that in Socomatics as well. Like I gave Ronaldo a bit too much credit there. Um, so the question is, uh, can we really say it's Ronaldo's achievement? Maybe it's Marcelo going up. That's exactly right. And when uh, in Socomatics, that's exactly what I wrote as well. How do you calculate passing tempo? Great question. I haven't done anything about this in the course. I definitely encourage people to look at this in detail. What you do is you first find all the passes in a sequence. So you make a, a possession chain. We're going to look at later about how you make a possession chain. But you find a sequence of unbroken passes. And then you look at how many passes are in that in the time of that sequence of, of um, passes. So um, you can look, you can use that to calculate the um, passing tempo. Um, so yeah, but that's something, I, I'll just say that again. You take the um, pass, you take the, you, all of the shot, all of the passes in a sequence, you uh, look at the number of passes in that sequence and you divide it by the time of that sequence. Um, shots, shots to penalty box and expected goals are kind of redundant because expected goal seems to contain numbers of shots and the quality of the shots. Not quite sure what that, that question means. Um, um, Okay. Um, there, but there is there are some questions about that. I recently read that Liverpool don't use expected goals in in their research. Um, I, I think that I think all teams use expected goals to some degree, um, or they use something like it. I think I, I covered this a little bit last time about expected goals is that 
there's lots and lots of different ways of, of seeing it. Everybody knows that, or, or there's just the basic way of seeing it is that if you get into better shooting chances, you're more likely to score. So Liverpool might not use expected goals in their research, or they might not say that they use expected goals in a research. But last time, if you look in the lecture, I showed that their strikers get into positions which maximise expected goals. So I think often it's the case that you don't that we've sort of moved past expected goals, or lots of analysis teams of uh, lots of lots of teams have moved past using expected goals. But that knowledge is baked into everything what they do, uh, everything that they do. And then the next thing to state about that is that following on from expected goals, there is lots of different ways of, um, of uh, there's lots of different, all the different methods are developed coming on from expected goals. I'm looking at myself here and I realize I'm looking up into the roof as if I'm divining knowledge instead of looking into the camera. It's because I've got myself on the screen. Um, Using number of passes up to a shot as a measure of requiring more dismisses a, a fast counter as a good a good choice. Exactly, I, I think what we're looking at here, I think I think it's really important when you look at these plots, is to not see me as making some sort of judgment about about um, if this is good football or bad football. It's not the def and we're going to come back to that. Is it's not necessarily the case that having lots of passes leading up to a shot is a good thing. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to characterize the style of football played by these various teams. And so it could well be that um, fast counterattacks is better. What we're actually trying to do at this point is just sort of find out how is it that England create their chances. And if they created them through fast counterattacks, then the passes would be further back in the pitch. So we're trying to get an idea for how England work. Um, how can we turn some defensive actions like tackles into possession, adjusted stats? Um, really good question. That's something that we're going to have to, we'll have to come back to. Um, again, you need to have an idea of the possession before you can find out how you adjust for the defensive actions. Um, while looking for new, K and new transfers, what do the KPIs of clubs look for and how do they compare it relative to a similar player they already have? Yeah, I think that's a question we'll come back to in about lecture six when we look at um, scouting. Um, I think as a general answer to all of the questions that are coming up, the questions seem to be focused on finding the optimal way of doing things. And one thing I, I kind of want to emphasize and come back to over and over again is that when you're doing this type of analysis, what you're doing is you're trying to understand how various football teams work. You shouldn't put too much judgment in that you're always trying to find the optimal thing. And I think that's related to what was said about Liverpool not using expected goals. So I don't think any team would say, all we're trying to do is optimize expected goals or all we're trying to do is optimize passes in the final third. What they're trying to do instead is use those types of things, how many passes teams make in the final third, in order to categorize how they play football and to better understand it. So if you're doing opposition analysis, you might use passes in the final third to think, well, is this a possession heavy team that are trying to break us down in the final third or are they a counterattacking team? And you use it to line up with how the coaches understand it. If you're trying to analyze your own team's performance, and we'll come back to this after the break, you would then say, well, where are we attacking from? Where are we most effective attacking from? And in England's case, we'd say, well, they're most effective attacking from the right-hand side. So all of this is an exploratory data analysis in order to try and better understand the processes by which different teams are playing, rather than a final word on this is exactly how you analyze football, if that makes sense. 